So Chris and David, it's nice to see you both. I know it's been a while because of the pandemic and everything. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us. Our uh, pleasure. I hope everyone's well. It's good to hopefully start getting back to a little normal. Yes, yeah. So I just want to do sort of um, a formal intro. So uh, we have David um, Canteros and Chris McKenna, both from Foley and Lardner LLP. So David is a partner, uh, actually they're both partners, and David is co-chair of the technology industry practice, and he specializes in business law, venture capital, and private equity. And Chris McKenna is actually a UMass Lowell alumni, class of 89, in the Francis College of Engineering. He's also a partner at Foley and Lardner. He's co-chair of both the technology industry practice as well as the electronics practice group. And he is an intellectual property attorney. So they're here today um, to speak to you both about the business formation and IP, which will be very instrumental to your ideas moving forward. And just like Raja has mentioned, they're just wonderful people and very helpful supporters of UMass Soul and our students and have helped teams like Invisaware, um, you know, guide them to success. And I'm also happy to say that um, Foley and Lardner LLP has been sponsoring the Idea Challenge for many years. So they sponsor $15,000 of in-kind legal service prizes that goes towards our student teams. So David and Chris, very nice to see you. I wish we could be in person, but definitely next year we'll be in person for the boot camp. Um, and I just wanna welcome you both. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Holly. Just for a note, uh, just to save you a few, uh extra letters, you can skip the LLP pod and just cause Foley and Lardner. So I'll save you, <laughs> save you those extra words in the future. So um, our pleasure here, Dave and I have been doing this. I don't know if this is maybe our third or fourth boot camp, I think. At um, least, yeah. Yeah, so we're happy to do this. We're very excited to be part of the program. Uh, there's a slide deck that'll be going, this slide deck will be going around. It's very dense, so we'll, we'll cover it as quickly as we can. So we won't spend a lot of time on Foley and Lardner. Large, AM Law 50 firms are one of the largest firms in the country. We essentially do A to Z in any type of legal um, work. And we represent, you know, pre-startups all the way to Fortune 20 companies that you would know, like Google and Facebooks of the world. Um, Dave and I spend a lot of time working together with early stage companies, um, helping mentoring, coach, help these uh, startup companies navigate in difference makers, one of our ecosystems that we spend a lot of time in. So we have a lot of experience on the ground, just helping um, you know, companies do the blocking and tackling. And today we'll, we're gonna talk about two basic blocking and tackling items for uh, typical for say anyone this out here in the audience who may wanna take the UMass low difference maker projects, turn it into a more than a project, turn it into a company. These are a couple initial areas you'd have to learn more about and we can help you with and doing that. So part of the session, just kind of socialize some of those, those building blocks for you to think about if uh, and you have the entrepreneurial spirit to, to move forward on any of your initiatives. So because we have a dense um, program here, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about, about Foley and we're gonna get right into it because uh, we have a pretty dense slide deck here and uh, we have about an hour to cover it. Um, my colleague Dave here is going to take the corporate side. I'll take the IP side. I'm going to run the slide deck. And from there, we're just going to move into it. I'm going to skip over the, the Foley part. I gave you the, the quick overview. And you guys can read those slide decks to yourself. We're, but here's a good point. We had to give you kind of real business experience and advice, just not kind of legal. It's all grounded in, in, in legal backgrounds. But what these early stage companies typically need to do and, and think about it and form the company. And here we go. The, the first one, um, Dave, I have your first slide up for choice of entity, if that's where you want to start off. Yeah, and um, I'll, I'll sort of hit the relevant parts of these slides and we can, we'll save some time at the end for questions. And like Chris said, we're always available uh, outside of this presentation. You know, you can always reach out to us by email for questions. Um, so when setting up a legal entity, um, you know, typically you got to set up a corporation or an LLC. Um, so what's the difference between the two? I have, we have S corporation here also, that's kind of fallen by the wayside. LLC's really replaced it, but, um, so the difference between a corporation and an LLC, um, which stands for limited liability company, they are both an entities that will shield the owners, uh, it, you know, from liability. So they're both entities that, um, 
you know, if, if there's something that goes wrong, it's that entity that did it. As long as you have perfect corporate formalities and people would go after that entity, they wouldn't go after the underlying equity holders of that entity, which would be the case if you didn't set up a legal entity and you just did it on your own, you, you ran a business on your own as a sole proprietor, um, you know, uh, you, you you would have personal liability if anything went wrong. So that's why you set up legal entities. That's one of the main reasons. That also then it helps you make raise money from investors and the like. But between a, between a corporation and an LLC, um, it really comes down to uh, tax treatment. An LLC is technically taxed. It is taxed as a partnership, whereas a corporation is taxed as a corporation. That means that when the corporation is profitable, that corporation pays a corporate level income tax. And then whatever is left over can be distributed to the owners, but those owners will then pay a tax, you know, on that money that's coming to them, usually in the form of a dividend. So that's two taxes that are paid with the corporation, whereas an LLC does not pay an entity level tax. Um, the whatever profits are in that entity will flow through to the owners, and then those owners will pay a tax. So the net money in your pocket is greater if you're profitable with an LLC than with a corporation because of the one level of tax. So why doesn't everybody do an LLC? Well, there was a time when they were heading in that direction, but a couple of things. Um, number one, the um, uh, corporations have been around forever and investors understand corporations, they understand corporate tax. Partnership tax has some funky things that you know uh, create a bit more complication. Number two, there are some interesting new uh, laws in place. This is very, very relevant, which is why this is important for consideration, that if you have a corporation, um, then when you sell your interest in that corporation, um, if you've held it for at least five years and if other conditions are met, um, which I won't go into, the first $10 million of gain, you don't have to pay a tax on. It's just free of tax. Um, Whereas, um, and that's, that's under this section of the code called uh, 1202. It's also called qual qualified small business stock. But all investors now, they want you to be a corporation. If it's the type of company that you are going to sell, uh, as opposed to if it's a lifestyle company you're setting up that you don't plan on selling and it's gonna be very profitable for many, many years, then an LLC makes sense. Um, but if it's a type of company where, as most tech companies are, where you're not going to be very profitable for the first few years, so you got to raise some money, then sell it, you know, at some point after five years, you want to be a corporation because all your investors will require it because they want to get that big break on taxes um, when the company's sold. So that's the S Corp. I'll give you one second on which S Corp allows you to get partnership tax treatment by filing an election, so long as you have certain conditions that are met. So you can basically get the same tax treatment as an LLC with an S Corp, um, but you could, you're limited as to the type of shareholders you can have and there's other limitations um, that don't exist with an LLC. So if, if effectively, if in, you, you don't get 1202 status with an S Corp, it has to be a C Corp. That's the break I was telling you about. So there's really no reason why somebody would be an S Corp anymore. They would just be an LLC or a C Corp. So those are the choices. Um, Delaware is generally where companies set up because it, there's a longstanding tradition in Delaware. That was really one of the first organizations years and years ago when, when companies started to get set up. There's lots of history there. Lots of um, cases have been tried there. So investors and owners understand what the rules are in Delaware and what you need to do to not run afoul of fiduciary duty obligations and what your protections are. There are people setting up entities in many other states, um, but the default is Delaware just because it, you know, investors, institutional investors will require you to be in Delaware. So you're better off just starting there if your plan is to raise money. If your plan isn't to raise money, then you don't have to be in Delaware. Okay, next. Uh, okay, so we covered Delaware, thanks Chris. Company formation. Setting up a company is really easy. Um, um, you know, you're just filing a piece of paper with Delaware uh, or whatever state you do it. Um, and, you know, we, we can do that or you can find, um, you know, Legal Zoom can do it. It's, it's you know, it's, it's easy to do. When you set up an entity, um, if let's assume we're gonna have a corporation, but the same pretty much applies with an LLC. You're gonna have a board of directors um, and um, 
Uh, and then the board of directors is going to have, you know, got to appoint officers to run the company. So effectively, you got to have three categories of people. You got to have the stockholders. Then you're going to have the board of directors that the stockholders choose. And then the board of directors will choose officers. The officers are the ones that are out there running the company on a day to day basis. That's your president, you know, your CFO. Um, they're the ones that are signing documents. Um, but they take direction from the board of directors, um, you know, for big, big transactions, really important documents, important hires, the officers need the board to approve it. And then massive things like selling the company um, or amending the certificate of a corporation, um, those or, or, or appointing new board members, those work, that requires approval of the shareholders. So at the end of the day, the shareholders really call the shots because they control the board and the board controls the officers. So if shareholders are unhappy with how a CEO is behaving, they can tell the board, fire that CEO, get a new CEO. And if the board doesn't do that, then the shareholders can fire the board and put a new board in place to put you know, officers in place that are more accommodating to the shareholders. That's generally how it works. But when you raise money, there are contracts that are put in place between investors in the company that kind of neuters the ability of the stockholders to uh, truly control the company at that point. But until such time, stockholders really call the shots. And with your companies, if you set up, presumably you'd be the stockholders, you'd be the board members, and you'd be the officers. So you wear all hats. Um, but as your company matures, you start to mix up those, um, those roles. Um, Every year you have to pay a fee um, to Delaware uh, in order to keep your company up and running. It's not bad. You wanna make sure you have a bank account for your entity so that you don't co-mingle funds. Um, if you co-mingle funds, then you can lose that liability protection that you want. Um, so it's important to maintain this sort of distinction between you guys as founders individuals and the legal entity. The legal entity is the business, it's not you. The legal entity should be Money should, should have a bank account of its own. It should be signing documents. The legal entity should not you guys, unless you do it as president of the legal entity, that's fine. Um, and, uh, and we'll talk about contract reviews in a bit. Um, and you gotta file a tax return every year and, and the like. Um, okay, next slide, Chris. Uh, so we talked, we, we covered this already, you know, which is stockholders are the ones that own the company and decisions are generally made by a majority of the, the holders of a majority of the stock. So it's not a majority of the stockholders. It's the stockholders that hold the majority of the stock. So when you set up a company, you know, you, you see that, you know, the 51% thing is really important. Yeah, you'll have, you know, two founders and one wants to own 51% because he or she wants to control the company. Um, that falls away, again, like I said, when you get investors, because you can own 90% of the company, but if you have an investor that has a contract where they put their money in that says they call the shots, not you, then your control thing has sort of gone out the window. It doesn't get that bad when you have investors. Usually it's just there's a there's a blocking right where an investor will put money in, investor owns 20% of the company, the original founders own 80%, but there'll be a contract in place that will say, you original founders can't sell the company without our approval. We can't sell it. We can't sell it, but you can't sell it without our approval. You can't do all these other things without our approval. And that's a negotiation that you'll do when you raise money, but it's pretty standard for you know, professional investors like venture capital funds or institutional investors to put in those protective provisions for themselves so that they can be a minority owner equity-wise, but still have a say in important decisions. Um, can you go to the next slide, Chris? Okay. So we talked about the role of the board of directors and the officers where the board is the one that, you know, they have fiduciary duties. And this is important, you know, you set up a company and, um, and you know, you think you're doing somebody a favor by saying, hey, I'm gonna put you on the board. And, you know, that person wants to be on the board because it sounds great. And it's a nice little feather in their cap that I'm on the board of directors of this company. The the risk there is that board members have fiduciary duties, which means there are circumstances where they have personal liability. So if the if the board, you know, um, 
doesn't really spend the time to really understand what the company's doing, if there aren't board meetings, and if the board, in, in at, or if there are, even if there are board meetings, if, if decisions aren't being made without, you know, real deliberation and thought, um, you know, or if the board allows things to happen, um, you know, they, if, if the board member is also an officer in the, and therefore the board member approves a, sort of a massive salary for the officer, while there are other shareholders in the company that they can be pissed. They can say, well, why are you paying yourself so much money? It's way above the norm. And the board, you're the board and you approved it or you're, you know, your co-founder and you are both the board and you both approve each other's salaries that are much higher than the norm. And you're basically sucking all the money out of the company. And we shareholders, as well as you as shareholders, but we shareholders are losing that value. Um, that's not fair. And that can be a breach of a fiduciary duty. There's lots of examples of breaches of fiduciary duties. Um, but so the bottom line is, as a board member, you have to be deliberate. You have to sort of follow prudent, um, prudent process of making decisions. Um, and if you don't, you can have personal liability. So moral of the story is, um, you know, when you're a young company, Sometimes advisors really don't want to be on the board. You, you can almost do them a favor and have them be an advisor and not a board member. When it's really, you know, when advisors would be more typically want to be on the board is when you have um, um, insurance and you can get director and officer liability insurance. It's not that expensive. Um, I wouldn't say you get it right away. You wait until your first financing when you have the money to start buying those things. But at that point in time, you'll see that, you know, venture capitalists, they don't want to be on the board until you have DNO insurance. And that's when I think you would have your advisors that have been helping you out elevate to the role of a board member when there's insurance in place. And oftentimes you need, they need to understand why you're not putting them on the board. And the answer is just for your own sake. We don't have DNO insurance yet. So we're going to call you an advisor on our website so we can get the notoriety of having you affiliated with us. And then when we get DNO insurance, you know, if you want to, we'll put you on the board and that would be awesome. And that's generally um, how that would work. Um, we covered officers, but the bottom line is, you know, you got to have a president, a secretary and a treasurer under Delaware law. Those are required, but you can have any other offices you want, CFOs, CTOs, EVP of finance, and you'll go ahead and, you know, figure out what's best for your company. Um, next slide. Um, Chris is going to talk about intellectual property. There's other things depending upon what your company does. Um, you know, if you're doing business outside of the U.S., and that, that includes just having a website where you allow people outside of the U.S. to come onto your website and buy your products. You have to understand whether you have any duties from an export standpoint. Do you have to do any filings with um, with the government because you're exporting products. What are you exporting? Does it you know, hit these different buckets of things that require filings? So these are, you know, uh, or are you, making, are, you, are you making something that, you know, can have drug applications? Are you making drugs, are you making therapeutics, in which case, or food, are you selling food products, in which case you have FDA potential filings, um, always intellectual property things you're gonna wanna do. So bottom line is when you set up a company, you know, you should work with your advisors to make sure that you're not, um, you're not missing any of these important regulations. Data privacy, like what are you, are you collecting information from people? What are you doing with that? Are you complying with sort of the different rules? Do you market your website to kids? There's a whole set of rules there. So um, lots of things to think about at a corporation. Next slide. So, for a second, you know, I want to talk about independent contractor versus employee. Most companies, when they get set up, they don't have any money, but they want, you know, people offer to help them, um, you know, whether to build a website or to just do some marketing for them. And, and, and oftentimes, um, you'll even hire somebody to basically work full time, but again, you don't have money. Uh, or you have a little bit of money you can give them, but you don't want to go through the hassle of having them be quote an employee because if they're an employee, you need to withhold. You need to give them the twos. You need to do you know stuff. You have contributed to biker and fooder and all that stuff, uh, which you'd hire a service, uh, a payroll processing service to do that for you. And you just started up, and you know 
you don't want to go through that. So you'd want to make them an independent contractor and you give them a consulting agreement and you say, listen, we don't have any money. So we'll give you a couple of shares uh, or maybe we'll give you some money here or there. You got to be really careful with that because um, states have uh, wage and hour laws. In Massachusetts, for example, they're very strict. If you have somebody, and there's this test that every state has their own test as to whether you're really an employee and should be characterized as such versus a consultant. But they're all kind of the same, which is, is the person, you know, is, the, is it the person that's doing the work or can that person farm it out? Um, are you expecting the person to work a certain number of hours, come to a certain location? Are they doing work that's core to your business or is it totally tangential? And there's a couple of other tests. But the bottom line is if, if, the, if the person sort of hits those categories, then you really need, you do need to call them an employee. And if you don't, which you won't, and many startups say, you know what, I don't care. I, you know, I have to make business decisions you know, because I'm an entrepreneur and I'm just not going to call that person an employee. I'm going to call them an independent contractor and they're going to have to pay their own taxes and I'm going to give them a 1099 and that's it. You can do that. You run the risk that um, that person becomes disgruntled, you know, for whatever reason down the road, you fire them, they hire a lawyer, the lawyer said you were mis you were mischaracterized, you should have been an employee, they should have withheld, and then you could sue, then they can sue you. And if you lose, you pay a fine to the state. In Massachusetts, it can be treble, treble damages, which is effectively what you should have paid them, which was minimum wage um, times three and uh, for the period of time that they're working. So I'm not saying you have to make everybody an employee. You just need to be aware uh, of the risks and you will take a calculated risk. But the, when you're able to really you know, have the infrastructure to bring them on as employees and do the right thing, you should do it sooner rather than later. This will come out when you raise money. Investors are going to ask you, have people been properly classified? You're going to have to represent that they have. Um, so the sooner you can comply with those rules, the better. Um, so next slide. Um, so um, <clears throat> one of the other issues is Again, using equity as currency, you don't have much money in the company. Um, and this happens all the time. Uh, Chris and I sort of, we see this all the time with entrepreneurs. So company doesn't have money. So back to my scenario about that, they're gonna have an independent contractor and they're gonna give this person some, um, uh, some equity uh, instead of um, paying cash because they don't have cash. So they're gonna use equity as currency. Um, so, first question is how much equity do you give somebody, right? And so entrepreneurs, you know, will say to them, well, you know, this person is really important to your company. You got to bring them on. Um, how much equity do you got to give them? And the person will say, you know, will say, how much do you think your company's worth? And um, well, let me back up. How much equity do you want to give them? Well, you know, it's an important person. It's sort of a co-founder. I'm going to give the person 30% of the company and I'm going to keep 70%. Okay, that's fine. Um, so you got to give them 30% of your company and that's going to be compensatory because they're working for you and that's, you know, that's compensation. Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, well, it, it, so you got to pay taxes on that. Okay. Well, you know, the conversation goes on. Well, we really don't have anything right now. So, you know, it's really not worth anything. Okay. That's fine. Now, if an investor were to come tomorrow and they were to say to you, I want to give you a million dollars. Um, as an investment in your company, what percent of the company would you be prepared to give that investor? And I'll let Chris answer what we hear all the time from investors. Chris, what's the usual answer we get? A 10%, 20%. 20% yeah. is high. Or yeah, 10% is so usually the answer. So, and, and I don't know if any of you were, went through that exercise in your head, but 10% is the answer that you often well, if you get a million dollars from an investor and you give that investor 10% of your company, um, you've just valued your company at $10 million, right? Because if a million gets you 10%, then the whole thing's worth 10 million bucks. So back to the scenario, you can go to the next slide, Chris. Go to, back to the scenario. You're paying your co-founder with 30% equity in your company. Your company is worth $10 million, which you've just said. So arguably, you're giving your co-founder $3 million of taxable income. And that co-founder is screwed because that co-founder needs to file uh, income taxes on $3 million of taxable income. 
but they got it in the form of stock that's illiquid. So how are they gonna pay, you know, the tax on that 3 million bucks, which is, you know, roughly a million bucks when you factor in state and federal and all that stuff, maybe a little less. So that's a big deal. So be very careful about using equity as, you know, to pay service providers, co-founders, you know, to pay somebody who builds a website to give them, you know, a thousand shares of stock. Be very careful because if the IRS does an audit and they see that you raised, similarly raised capital or had term sheets out to raise capital, showing a valuation like $10 million, they're going to draw the line to what you should have, you know, given that person, you know, in their 1099. Um, and, you know, and there's going to be an, an issue. So, um, there's ways around it that we're not going to go into as far as using different types of things like warrants and options, but, you know, just, um, those are issues that we see all the time with startup companies. Uh, and this slide that we're on now talks about the things we look at when issuing equity, you know, which is the compensation tax stuff we talked about. There's also rules about making sure that anybody who gets stock in your company is you know, fully informed and you should have in writing that they know exactly what you're doing and they've been apprised of all the risks so they can't come back and say you misled them. Um, so that's my world of corporate stuff. Um, things to be sort of wary of when you set your company up and it's not all that bad. We got to tell you the stuff that, you know, you got to, just so you can, you know, be mindful not to just do all these things without talking to advisors and then be shocked later on. So as long as you, Check in with your advisors whenever you're gonna give out equity, whenever you're gonna hire somebody and have an agreement. You know, it's a really quick discussion you can have and you know, and it will save headaches down the road. So thanks for sort of uh, indulging me with this fun, you know, discussion on corporate matters. And Chris will take over on the IP front. Yeah. And before I go to IP, anyone have any questions or comments for Dave? That's okay if you don't. One thing I want to just share from my experience working with uh, difference makers and, and projects that come out of that, who or teams that come out of that, who may be considering doing something entrepreneurial on the corporate side. When they do come visit us, I, I, you know, I treat them just like I would if a family member or one of my kids were starting a company. And you know, a team of three, four, or five may come to us and say, hey, we want to figure out what entity we want to form. And I always ask, well, have you guys kind of figured out you know, sometimes some of the teams still in school, sometimes some of the people after school, some people are working. And I said, have you, have you had the discussion among yourselves of what you wanna do with this project, right? In terms of it's great to start a company, but usually when you start a company, it's because you're gonna put good faith effort forward as a team to work the company to either get funded or get it off the ground and, and bring other team members in. And have you had that kind of life discussion among yourselves to say, are we ready to do that? Because some team members say, hey, I need to go get a full-time job. I only can participate to a certain level. Other people might say, I'm all in, I'm gonna be 100%. Because then the next question becomes, well, have you figured out how the, the equity is gonna work among the team members in that? Because there's gonna be, not everyone might be ready to be an entrepreneur and there'll be different levels of effort and considerations there. So every time they come to me, I have that discussion with them. If their eyes wide, get wide open, they go back and have sort of those life discussions along with what they really want to do and what their level of participation in the company can be. And then from there, you get a better sense of who's, who's more all in and how the equity falls out. So I just shared that. If anyone here is interested in being an entrepreneur, you really should have some of those discussions and we're, we're happy to mentor you on that. And because we're moving quickly here and I have a pretty dense slide as well, I'll, I'll move it along to the IP side of consideration, which is, okay. Can I, can I just interrupt quickly? One student has his hand raised. Do you mind okay. picking a question? Okay. Uh, Elliot. Uh, yes, I had a, one question about S Corps and I know there's a somewhat new type of corporation called a uh, B Corp as well. Are there any advantages to doing a B Corp? Oh, David, you're on mute. Okay, um, so S Corp, we talked about briefly, which is something that I, I don't think you should be doing. You should be doing an LLC or a C Corp. S Corp doesn't get you any advantages. You can't get with either one of those. A B Corp is a benefit corporation. And you would do a benefit corporation if you are doing something that is more on the charitable side. 
uh, in the benefit corporation gets you, you know, recognition um, that, you know, that you can advertise that you are, you know, a benefit corp and you are providing services that qualify you as a benefit corp. Um, it's been, you know, we've looked at benefit corps. Some of our clients are benefit corps. We've looked at lots and at the end of the day, the tax benefit you, do, you get, if you get any, I just forget, but it's not sufficiently meaningful. Like it's not, it doesn't give you the benefit of like a 501c3 charitable corp where investors can get a deduction on their money that they put in. That doesn't happen for benefit corps. So as an investor in a benefit corp, there's restrictions as to what the corporation can do, must do to be qualified as a benefit corp. So if I'm an investor and I'm managing someone else's money, I have fiduciary duties to my investors. So putting money into an entity that's limited as to what it can do, I, I wrestle with whether that's in the best interest of the investors who my mandate is to make them a lot of money. So there's that tension, um, you know, so if you gotta set, if you gotta set up a corp and your goal is to raise money from investors, a benefit corp in my view um, will make it even that much more difficult. If you gotta be funding it yourself or you have investors that are all in on your benefit corp mission, then that's great. Then you can do a benefit corp if that's what you wanna do. But you know, th those are some of the risks that I see. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Pop it over to IP. So here's my first slide. I say every company has it, even if not registered. I put the slide intentional because when people say IP, they always think I have to have a patent or trademark, something that's registered. So people equate IP with registered forms of IP. Those are the tools you can use to protect IP, but everyone has it, right? So every company is coming up with ideas. You're doing some design, some strategies, analysis, research, business information, all that. You know, it's called proprietary confidential information. That is a form of IP. Whether or not you protect it to be a registered form of IP is, some, is an intentional act you take um, to do that. So I tell people this, every company has IP full stop. They may not register it. I may not be able to register it because it may not be registrable. Like it, it may it may not be patent protectable. But I want to make sure everyone you know knows they have IP because that'll be an important concept and in, form in your company. And there's some other ownership issues with regards to it. So knowing that everyone has IP, what are the tools available to you to protect it? Right. So people heard of patents. And these is a right to exclude others to have a monopoly over your idea and it protects inventions and has a, a certain level of requirements to meet the threshold of patentability. Um, it requires public disclosure. It gives you a 20 year you know, uh, monopoly on the idea. It's expensive too, right? Because they're giving you a lot in terms of that. Copyright is, you know, all of you probably have written papers and works of authorship and could be from software to a white paper, or a blog article, things that you author, uh, protects your creative expressions. Um, and, you know, that's very inexpensive to, to protect. And so you have copyright protection in those, either registered or unregistered. Trademarks is another form of registered IP where um, if you have a brand name, it could be a tag, a product name, a company name, a slogan, something that's going to identify the source of the good or service, you can apply for a trademark so that when you're out um, selling your services and goods and services, it, you know, people recognize the, the goodwill and brand that goes along with that. That's less expensive than patents, but still costs some money to do that because you're working with the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Trade secret you know, is just a way, if you have a certain set of confidential information that um, has certain business value to it and you keep it a secret, meaning you're not sharing it with folks, that's something you can keep, you know, there's no registration for it. There's not too much you need to do except keep it a secret, it's free. Um, and a lot of companies leverage trade secrets as a form of IP. Contracts, people don't think of it as a form of IP protection, but it really is in a whole bunch of different ways. Every company will be using contracts for protection of IP. Um, you see, Dave and I will form a company for you. One thing we have all the employees um, do a contract with the company to say that they're going to keep everything confidential. Anything they develop for the company is going to be owned by the company. So they're going to sign all their rights to the IP to the company. When you do non-disclosure agreements, um, confidential agreements with third parties, that's another form of IP protection. And 
in even when you license in your product, right? Say you've got a software product, you're licensing it. There's a license, you're not selling it, you're licensing it. So you're controlling the use of your IP, even if it's not patents, it's just source code in that form. So these are all the tools I wanna make you aware of and depending on the situation, the stage of company, um, you may use some of these. Um, different types of IP can overlap and I'll use software, just it's an easy one for a lot of people to, earn, to kind of get their arms around where you can have, use all those tools on the same piece of technology, right? So a software may have some certain functions that could be patentable. Um, they may be, it's copyrightable because you wrote some source code, authored the, the software. There may be a trademark on it, be the, the brand name, the product name. Trade secrets, like the object, the source code itself could be a trade secret or some secret sauce underneath the hood that no one knows about, it's a trade secret. Contracts, you're gonna, again, license this to a bunch of folks so you can, uh, you can control that. One thing to note, you can't keep something a trade secret and patent it at the same time because the, the policy of the, the government and giving you a monopoly on your invention is that you're gonna further progress the sciences and disclose how to make and use the invention. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. Um, so a lot of times patent versus trade secret becomes a strategy to consider whether or not it's likely a competitor or someone else is gonna infringe, whether or not you can detect their infringement. Um, you know, For example, let's say you're a software company that does recruiting but you came up with an invention that has to do with memory management on your server that makes it work really well. Well, you know, that's not your core technology and what you're known for. And if another recruiting firm website was using that, you'd probably have a hard time knowing that they're infringing that. So that might be one where we would keep a trade secret versus patent protection. So we have to kind of figure that out in a strategy. Uh, quickly going over patentability framework, and I'll tell you in the patent office perspective, but switch it over to the um, more of an entrepreneur technology uh, executive perspective. So the same requirements are for all inventions. It could be a drug, it could be a mechanical invention, it could be software, um, anything in between. It has to have three requirements, useful, novel, and not obvious. Useful means it has some utility. For example, software functions or using some kind of mechanical, you know, mouse trap, right? It has some utility, so that's pretty easy. New meaning it doesn't exist, so um, all, it doesn't exist in that form of the invention, right? So that no one else has made this invention already. That's pretty easy too. You can't scour the whole earth, but for the most part, most entrepreneurs, when they have a project, they're solving a new problem and some new challenges because a solution doesn't exist for it yet, or the solution that does exist is has some issues with it that you're solving. So you're adding some functionality to solve that problem. Non-obvious is the tough part because uh, most folks always use reverse engineering. I was an electrical engineer at UMass Lowell. So when I, if I went down and solved a you know, wrote software for a couple of weeks and finished it up and I showed it somebody, they would say, oh, I know how you did that now. I'm using hindsight. Even though I might have solved a, a challenging problem in a unique way, the fact that I know how it works doesn't, at the end, doesn't mean it's not patentable. And as human beings, we tend to use hindsight when we look at this. But the standard is that one skilled in the art, looking at all the existing products and patents out there wouldn't just put them together without any creative effort. So they say, oh yeah, you take this and this and put it together, you're simply gonna get that. And so that has a lot of strategy with that. So I share that because um, a lot of folks put a, a high threshold on patentability where it's actually a lower threshold. All inventions are made up of prior art, right? These are building blocks, right? And I'm gonna share that for, uh, again, I'll use software as an example, just again, like a website, because it's very accessible for folks. Servers known, operating systems known, web servers known, databases are known. You can go get a bunch of open source projects for GUIs and widgets and stuff, and that's all known. But it still doesn't do what you need it to do. So that's the existing building blocks of your stack that I show him on, on the slide. And on top of it, you're adding something new to it, right? That's where you're adding value on top of that stack. So a more strategic approach to look at that is Look at your, I call it your white space, right? You've taken all this existing application hardware, everything you could buy off the shelf, and it still doesn't do what you want it to do because you have to add on top of it. 
that's where you're going to focus on your IP considerations, right? You either added some new functionality, some new behavior, and those are going to be also your competitive differentiators when you're pitching the company. So I, I usually tell folks, instead of asking the question whether it's or not it's compatible, because this is what I do for a living, it's a hard question to answer and harder for people who haven't done it before, is new. Do you know of any competitors who have such features or products that do these functions, right? Um, the answer is probably no, right? And then does it have some value to you? Meaning this is the, the issues we're solving, the challenges we're overcoming. These are the things we're gonna tout about our company, right? And so it has some strategic value. And also I always say, I always use the emotional test. If you saw someone else copy that feature, how would you feel about that? You, would you feel like they took your idea? So those are kind of the candidates for um, potential inventions disclosures that we could develop a strategy around. So again, all inventions are made up of prior art. Um, you're always usually adding to some prior art stack on yourself. Otherwise, you're you're taking something that just purely exists and maybe you're an execution play and just making it, uh, you know, selling it better, which is a great company to have. But most of the companies I meet are always adding something new to the prior art. And those are things to consider for patentability. Another thing, a slide I put in here too is data. Um, I say the data is a new form of IP currency. So as, as a lot of these platforms get rolled out, a lot of times you're collecting data and that data can give you some analytics and some insights in understanding that um, your data flows and your technology are pretty important because who owns it? You wanna be respectful from you know, the customers who may be giving you data that they own it. Um, wanna respect their privacy too in terms of personally identifiable information. But a lot of times your tools or systems or processes are taking that data, turning into other data for tenants in, in your system that are gonna help you um, further provide service and value to your customers. So always pause to have people always stop and think about um, downstream how they may use the data they collect to provide value back to the company and or their clients. So IP strategy, the, um, I always say have one, make IP decisions intentional, make a part of your corporate resume. I have a lot of companies, I'll ask them, what are you, how are you different? They say, we're faster, better, easier. Okay. Well, I just talked to you know, a SaaS company and then I talked to a drug company. They both said the same thing. Well, it has to be related to your product. Like what's the, what in your, in your service or product is enabling those differentiators? What's enabling to be faster, better, easier to use? Um, because those are the areas you probably really wanna focus on IP protection because those, those are the technology enabler. We gave you, you know, part of here was to kind of give you a toolbox of the tools you know, from patents to contracts that you may consider for IP protection. And, and, and then also I gave you a little bit of perspective on how you might identify some candidates for patentability. Um, one thing to note too, IP is in like one and done, is if you look at companies like a Google or Facebook that we, we represent, why do they have some of the largest patent portfolios in the world? Just that Google search box, for example, it looks simple, right? You could say you could patent that once and be done. They have thousands of patents on that because as they build new features and as you as you roll out, you'd have your first generation of product, you'd have make them get feedback from you know, your advisors, customers, and makes new generations and new versions of that. Each of those are opportunities where the new new stuff that you added to the product could be some new IP to protect. It is IP, but there may be protectable features or certain registered forms of IP want to do that. So always try to make IP intentional from the get-go and, and through um, product development. I'm quickly gonna go over some, you know, these are more for operational companies, but some, some things to think about early on that may be important um, to an early stage company. Ownership of IP is really a, a big one. And the reason is if anyone's gonna invest in you as a company, they're gonna want to make sure that you own all the IP, right? Because a lot of times the IP is what they're buying, the product, the service. And how does that, how does IP ownership work in a very clean form? You know, I form a company, everyone who works on the technology, either as an employee contractor, has assigned a written agreement that they're going to sign all the IP rights to the company. Okay. Now, if they don't, especially contractors, right? Um, Employees could fall under a doctrine called work for hire, saying that all their work they do for the company is owned by the company if it's not a written agreement, but it's a best practice to have a written agreement. 
if you have contractors or third parties that are working on your technology and they don't have a written agreement to assign the IP to the company, technically they own the IP. You may own the deliverable of the tangible form of it, but the IP rights can stay with the contractor. So that becomes an important thing. So when I do due diligence on companies that are early stage, we're trying to figure out who contributed to the IP and let's look the trail of paperwork to that. So now let's bring it to the reality of early stage companies, these projects that you're working on. A lot of you are on projects who may go forward and be entrepreneurial and may, and may not, but if you were to go forward, right, what do early stage companies do? They'll get friends, people in their network, someone's building a website, someone's building this other piece, you're doing it on a handshake, which is all fine. You might be doing it on some promises and future equity. Now, you go to form a company, I, and I run into this with, with other companies of UMass Whole System. Now, hey, we need to document that you're assigning all the IP to the company. Well, how about that person doesn't want to join the company, but they contribute a lot to the technology? you may have to give them some consideration for that because they may not just want to sign this official legal document assigning the IP rights to the company. So there's, there'd be some issues there. So things to can, kind of consider. I did, in an ideal world, you'd love to have everyone papered in terms of having an agreement. Um, you know, it's measured risk, as Dave said, calculated risk is that you may then think of at some point, um, as you move along and get more serious, how to how to paper these things. So that's a lot of these projects are always going to be issued because you don't have an entity. So if you have three, four people working on it, technically you jointly and severally own all the IP, and anyone can walk away and do what they want with it because they own it, right? So at some point, the reason we have entities is the first point is to have like an entity that can get um, in Dave's side get invested in, but also limit liability, protect. Um, you know, personal liability. On our side of the IP, it's really to be a container to hold all the contributions then and treat it under the corporate governance of the, you know, shareholders, the board of directors, and the operators of the company. So IP ownership will always be a, an issue for your early stage project type companies that we'll have to work on. Um, this is, again, is a little bit more downstream, you know, joint efforts. Joint IP is, can be bad. Like a lot of times, instead of using equity as currency, they'll they'll find somebody who's gonna help them build the IP. Again, if you don't have a written agreement and a, another party owns your IP, well, as an investor, I'm probably not that interested in investing in your company. If another partner can go and, and, and build and sell the same product. Important patent dates, this becomes, an, you know, this is regardless if you formed as an entity or not, this is also an important point is that under US patent law, um, well, under all, all patent office law, if you publicly disclose the invention, it creates what's called a bar date, B-A-R. And in the US, they'll give you a 12 month grace period from that public disclosure to file. Outside the US, uh, most companies don't have a grace period. So what's a public disclosure? Let's say I'm doing a, you know, a detailed power, not, not just the existence of my technology, but I do a, a disclosure. I'm taking someone through a, a demo, or a PowerPoint slide that goes into some details of the invention that I want to, the subject matter I want to protect, that's a public disclosure, right? So uh, a, lot of, a lot of early stage companies hit that date inadvertently, some intentionally because they're not ready, you know, they have to try to raise money, talk to customers, they have to socialize their ideas with the ecosystem and it's a chicken and egg thing on that. But knowing that those dates exist, that you have the public disclosure date, um, you know, some, some companies try to file a, you know, established companies will file a patent application before that public disclosure date so that they can go to talk to people about it, which also shows some sign of ownership, but also doesn't trigger the public disclosure because it's already on file. And sometimes from a practical point of view, it's hard to do, but it's important day for you guys to know there's something for you to manage and there's some things you sometimes can do, um, you know, if you have the time and resources to protect it by filing. Non-disclosure agreements, a lot of times people see this as a tool to protect their IP. Yes and no. Remember, a non-disclosure agreement only protects the confidentiality of the information you're gonna share, right? And it shouldn't give a license to anyone to your IP. So if I'm in a room, I'm company A and I'm in a room with company B and I share my ideas with them, well, they, they can't go disclose it to third parties, okay? So that's great, they can't do that. They obviously learned about it and maybe they get some, some walking knowledge or some idea, their own ideas from it. Um, they shouldn't have the right to use it, 
but they still got to disclose. Now that's different from um, what happens, as we know, you put a bunch of engineers or smart people in a room and you get a whiteboard and I'm company A, I talk about my ideas are A, B, and C. Company B says, hey, Chris, did you think about doing D and E? I said, no, that's a great idea. Now we're joint owners at A, B, C, D, and E, right? We, can, we collaborated under NDA. There's no, who owns that? Well, without any other written agreement, we both own our parts of it or own it. You know, we're both inventors on that. So the NDA will help keep that confidential, but it doesn't really help some of those um, other issues that might be creep, creep up. So you have to be careful of those as well. Um, IP shows up in a lot of different areas, right? So every time you go to sell, what's called sell, it could be license your technology. So you can have a website that has terms of use, a software license agreement, you're doing some beta and demo agreements. If I'm giving somebody some software to use for free, well, I don't want to give it, I want a contract that says you're licensing this for limited purposes, right? Because you're controlling the use of your IP, even distributed agreements. So all your commercial agreements will always have some IP aspect to it. And you want to, this is where contracts come in as a IP protection mechanism to control that. Um, and it's also an opportunity if you're going to talk about, um, if you're doing some collaboration between entities, who's going to own what part of the collaboration? If you get in um, your know, data, sharing data between the companies, who can use the data and whatnot. So again, IP is about making it intentional so that you protect um, what I call IP leakage. IP leakage, having written agreements with your contracts, employees, non-disclosure agreements to talk, uh, talk about it comfortably with third parties. If there's public disclosure dates that are coming up, you, know, you decide intentionally whether or not you're gonna take action. Anytime you're doing some kind of third party agreement, you need to think about how the IP is implicated. Um, and also, if you're going to talk about any strategic relationships, either with potential partners or um, customers, you want to think about the posture of your IP in the context of, context of that, those negotiations, because it's a lot of, you know, people a lot of times focus just on the money part, um, but you got to be sensitive that you're not giving away the farm in terms of your IP. And this is really for companies a little further downstream where you might be doing, getting an investment. And if you have an investor come in, they're gonna do due diligence on your company. And one areas that we do is IP, right? So what's your questions I might ask, what's your IP strategy? Do you have any IP assets? How do you protect them and why? Um, and what's the scope and strength of those? And then are you working on a landscape where there's a lot of other IP that you have to worry about? Um, that can also generate a risk for the investors if they see you in a very litigious space with a lot of litigations going on. How do you how do you fit how do you fit from a risk profile in that space? So IP is definitely a component for investors, um, you know, coming in to look at companies that you may form. Usually it starts off with, you know, it's a nice to have some forms of IP protection because they like that. Because at the end of the day, if I'm an investor, you know, you're selling a lot of upside. But the downside is if something happens to the company and it doesn't really get off the ground, what do you, you know, usually have people, computers and, you know, other buildings, retail, not even, you know, office stuff, and then you have the IP, right? So the people and the office stuff goes away at the end of the day, what might protect their investment that they might be able to leverage and do something with the IP. So that's how they're looking at it from a risk management tool on that. Um, some quick things that are probably applicable to not just IP diligence ready, just for your, any company is what's your IP strategy? Do you even have one? Um, do you own your IP, right? Um, what are your functional differentiators from the competitors? So again, what are those features in your solution or your product or service that differentiate you from the competitors that enables you to be quicker, faster, better? Who are your competitors and how are they different? And then are you working on a landscape with this, you know, other parties with, you know, heavy IP, um, either patents or litigation that you might have to think about. And that's it. So thank you. And let me see if I can share some, I'm trying to think about some anecdotal things that I, I come across um, when working with projects going, that become an entrepreneur. I think the biggest one is probably the ownership one, really thinking that through. Um, you know, I talked about the conversation about equity split among all the founders. 
usually that ties into it. Well, if someone's not going to join the company, the next question is, do they develop IP? Oh yeah, they were important to this pack. Okay, now we have to ask them to assign it to your company that are going to start. How are they going to feel about that, right? And usually, you know, people will sit there and say, hmm, um, yeah, I don't feel comfortable just signing this document and let you go start a company using my ideas that I'm not going to be part of unless I'm going to get something for it. So that's probably one of the, the early issues that come up um, with companies that are coming out of UMass Global Difference Maker. Um, then a lot of people also trying to figure out whether or not to patent something, even if they're not starting a company. And the, uh, the, the comment there is, it's hard to be a, a pure license and play like, hey, I'm just going to patent my gear, have a bunch of patents and sell them. That's a business in itself and takes a lot of work. So it's usually a chicken and egg. I say, look, patents are there to usually protect a startup company's you know, products and revenue and the revenue stream and to get funded. So I may only have you invest in a patent if you're really going ahead with the company, right? Because if you're not going ahead with the company, you just have a patent there, then selling the patent on its own is a company in itself, right? So you have to have a different strategy for that. So that's another area that kind of comes up is, are they ready to patent based on the context of where their entrepreneurial um, kind of venture is? So with that, I'll stop because um, Dave and I could talk about this all day and we're right at the top of the hour, um, which is perfect timing, but I'll open it up to any, any questions or comments. Hey, Chris, let me chime in on one thing for real world, sure. for sort of real experiences. I'm going through this right now with the financing for a company that's raising lots of money from, um, from some big West Coast uh, companies that you'd know, their name brand companies. And they're putting $30 million into this company, our, my, our client, which is a technology company. And um, one of the issues we're struggling with now is that our client was not diligent about getting assignment of inventions, you know, confidentiality and assignment of inventions documents signed by consultants early on and also a whole slew of employees early on. They just weren't diligent about that. And now, you know, on diligence, these investors are saying, okay, can you confirm that everybody signed uh, an, assign an assignment of inventions, putting all the IP in the company? And the answer is, there's like 30 people that didn't out of the 100 people that have cycled through the company from beginning until now. So we're a quandary, like, you know, so the company, investors want these things signed because they want to make sure the IP is owned by the company and not jointly owned by these inventors, people who might have touched the IP. So company has to go and find, track down these 30 people, get them to sign this. And then there's an enforceability question. If you don't pay somebody for something, for, for signing a contract, is it even valid? So it's just a bit of an issue. And these things can all be sort of addressed early on if you're diligent about it. And just a handful of other things you need to do early on, and it will save really big headaches later on. So that's just a, an example real time about one of the points that Chris raised. Um, David, I have a quick question about that. Is that that's not applicable, right? If the LLC has yet to be formed, so that would be only applicable like once an LLC there's a, a liable entity to sign the NDAs over, like the NDA responsibilities to. Yeah. So what will happen is, let's say you, you know, let's say you have an idea with sort of you know a, a co-founder right now, and you haven't yet formed your LLC, but you're brainstorming with a third person, and the, and that third person gives you some you know some 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 ideas that are proprietary that you're going to use, um, and that now, so right now that that information is owned jointly by the three of you, even though you haven't set up a legal entity, as the three of you are collaborating, coming up with these ideas. So you each own rights in that IP. You then set up a company next week. You, maybe you decide to set up, you know, a, a corporation next week. And you and your co-founder are the owners of that corporation, that third person who you are sharing ideas with, you decided you don't want them in the company. When you set up that company, typically what happened, when you set up the company, you, you and your co-founder still own the IP, so does that third person. The company doesn't own anything. You just set up the company. So normally what you would do is you and your co-founder as part of setting up the company would then contribute your IP into the company. You'd sign up an assignment of inventions that would just put that in the company as part of setting it up. If you don't get that third person who isn't part of your company now to sign over their, you know, whatever IP was developed that they jointly own, they're going to forever jointly own it. 
So that's, you know, you kind of look at, you have to look at the genealogy of your IP. Like when did it begin? When did we start building it? Whether or not we had a company then, you need to, you know, make sure that it all finds its way into the company. Thank you. Sure. And, and, and Dave, just to add to that, that's exactly when doing due diligence we look for. It's like, okay, before you form the company, who was working on it? And are they part of the company now? Because that's where IP leakage can occur. So rate that. So IP starts as an issue from the get go. Thank you, uh, Sid. You have a question. Yes, uh, Dave, Chris, Dave, thank you very much for your presentation. I had a quick question regarding the IP strategy itself. So if a company exists solely for the purpose of licensing its technology, at what point along its IP strategy should they start looking for uh, potential customers to license their patent or geared towards technology commercialization? Well, I guess when you say license the technology, are you licensing the patents or are you, license, are you actually going to be developing technology to give to a third party to kind of either further develop or, or that. So a lot of it, um, a lot of it depends what you're trying to accomplish with the company. I mean, if your whole sole goal is to make money on IP, well, you probably should understand that right up front and start doing that, right? Um, so I guess I, I would need a little bit more, more context on, on that in terms of, of that. I think that was pretty helpful for what I wanted to understand. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, just that comes up a lot again. I just, I want to tell yeah. people that selling IP is hard. Okay. Let's say mm -hmm. I want to make maybe a clear example. I could have three or four patents. Very, I consider them valuable. If you can't make the commercial market for yourself. So, and you come to me as a third party and I'm a big company. Why am I buying it from you? Right. Is, you know, I have to first believe there's a couple of things. First, I have to believe there's a market for the technology that I would develop that the patent covers, right? And, and figure all that out, right? And you haven't. So I'm like, why, again, why am I buying the patent? So sometimes you can sell patents because they already developed the market and you know, they're infringing. So to your point, some people wait to let other people you know, trip over their IP to try to monetize it. But from the beginning, if there's two things to sell. If it's a new market that doesn't exist, and I'm going to buy your IP. You have to convince me first that the market is worthwhile going after, right? There's money to be made on technology because of the patent and that your patent is valuable to that. So it's like a two-stage sell. Now, you can be a licensing company if it's just not on paper. If you have technology, let's say, hey, we're going to be a back-end system like white label. We're going to build like um, a framework and some base technology that someone else can take and make an application out of it. Well, now you're licensed in tech, right? You have a value proposition because you're saying, hey, time to market, it's gonna be reduced. Um, you know, we have something that's working that's gonna all you get there faster, along faster. So um, all of those are different, uh, all businesses still the same and have their own sales strategy and marketing plans and biz dev. So um, yeah, it, they're all businesses. It not, one's not easier or harder than the other. I would actually sometimes just trying to license IP can be harder because it's not as fluid market as commercial products. Understood, thank you. Yep. Other questions? Uh, Schmitty. Um, so I had a question regarding the bar date. Um, I know for that you said it was one year after public disclosure. Um, yep. Does sharing your ideas through something like Difference Maker, um, is that considered a public disclosure? <laughs> Great question. Um, it could be. It depends what you disclose, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm disclosing, um, hey, I have, a SAS, I have a website that does X, Y, and Z, but the, how you do the X, Y, and Z is the invention, not the fact that you do an X and Y and Z? Maybe not. But let's say in Difference Maker, I lay out a a demo of my product and, and there's no expectation of confidentiality and, and someone can see exactly how it works, then yes, that would be a public disclosure. Okay, all right, thank you. So it's very fact specific on the level of information being presented. Mm -hmm. Within Difference Maker, just holistically, I would say it's an idea challenge. So all the teams here, 
there was real no secret sauce or sketches or anything like that show. There were no demos. So I think to this point, um, it hasn't been fully disclosed, but once you maybe start meeting with your mentors and developing your product more and showcasing it to potential customers, that's when I think it would be disclosed. Is that correct, Chris and David? Like more yeah, I would say there's, there's, you know, on the goalposts, right? Yes, you know, just having the, ex the presence or the existence of a high level abstract idea itself is not, A, you can't patent it, first of all, right? Because it, it has to be tied to some technical implementation. So generally speaking, if I'm at that high level, probably not an issue, right? Now, sometimes people, right? If I'm an engineer, I may, in my slide deck start really laying it out. Like I might have like a circuit diagram and say, I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. And that was the thing we wanted to patent protect. Then it would be a public disclosure. So it's a little fact specific, but I think you have it right in the terms of, you know, ideas are meant just for kind of, hey, high level ideas to see if I can get some traction, get a form, see if I can go spend some more time developing it. Not sure exactly how I'm gonna build it yet. Those are ideas themselves, we couldn't patent protect, so it would be fine. If someone's further along, because I know some companies come back, like, you know, they've been doing it for some time and they come back, maybe not an idea challenge, but a difference maker, come back a little bit further along and they actually have a kind of fine tuned implementation that they're disclosing, then it's definitely more of an issue. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Any other last questions? Okay. So it looks like that's it. Chris and David, I know there's a lot of nice comments coming through. All the students, you know, thought your presentation was very helpful. So I just want to thank you both for your time and your support of Difference Maker um, and all of this information. It's been really helpful. And I just really appreciate your sponsorship of the Idea Challenge as well. So thank you for your time today. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Nice to see you all. Yes, thank you. It's nice to see okay. you both. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.